Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Hey, folks, it's Shay here, and I'm grateful to have you back as a listener, or whether you're new or returning, thank you for tuning in to Casual Cattle Conversations. Today, we are going to be visiting with John Schiefelbein, and we are going to be talking about leadership in the beef industry. We're going to talk about the direction of the beef industry and really where we need to focus, put our focus, and just some thoughts to ponder as beef producers, whether we are leaders or joining organizations or trying to figure out what we stand for as individuals and as an industry as a whole. So with that, I want to remind you all to go to my website and sign up for my free newsletter. And that's going to send information that's free straight to your inbox every Wednesday. And uh, that'll be industry news updates, podcast episodes, all that good stuff. It's a short, quick read for you. With that, let's visit with Dawn. Hey folks, I want to introduce you to a breakthrough in cattle deworming from Zoetis. This is the only prescription cattle dewormer with two active ingredients in one dose. Meet Valcor, Doramectin, and Levamisole injection. Now you can achieve effective parasite control in one product instead of two. It's never been easier to be tough on tough worms. Get tough today at Valcor.com. Do not treat cattle with Valcor within 15 days of slaughter. Not for use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older, including dry dairy cows. Not for use in beef calves less than 2 months of age, dairy calves, and veal calves. See full pricing information at valcortuff.com slash pi, and that link will be in the show notes. Well, Don, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to visit with myself and my listeners and talk a little bit about leadership And before we dive into that, I would like you to share a little bit with my listeners about your background in the beef industry and what you're doing today, just briefly. I know I've had the ability to get to know you a little bit and hear you speak before, so I'm familiar with it, but how would you share that with the rest of the the listeners? Well, I'm from a large family farm, and when I say large, I mean there's a lot of family members. So I farm with seven brothers, six nephews. All of their collective wise, my dad and my mother. And when you add up the whole crew, there's about 80 of us all working together, trying to make a living in Kimball, Minnesota. We're a diversified uh, farming and ranching operation. We primarily have a seed stock operation, but uh, feed about 20,000 head of cattle a year and do a bunch of crop farming as well. But basically a diversified family farming operation, very much like probably most of your listeners Ours is just maybe just on steroids, Shay, so we're just a little larger than some. Well, it has to be with that many people working there and trying to keep it in the family, I'd imagine. Yeah, and you know, people always ask the question, they say, well, how does that many people get along? And I said, well, we just hold hands and sing Kumbaya all day long. That's just how it works. But, <laughs> uh, you probably know better that sometimes you have to work through issues and uh, the good thing about a family operation is you get to know that family pretty well during some of these business operations. That is absolutely true. So Don, I know you have served in several leadership roles in the beef industry. And before we kind of, actually, let's start there. What can you talk about what some of your leadership roles in the beef industry have been and how you're serving as a leader in the industry today? Well, yeah, I've had lots of experience and been blessed with lots of experience. I like to consider myself the Forrest Gump of the cattle industry because I don't know how I fall into these positions, Shay. Some of them just happen, and I don't know why I become the Forrest Gump that all sends in front of the president of the United States, et cetera. But I've been blessed to be in lots of positions. I started my career off in the breed association world, and actually that's where I got to know your father. But uh, we, I was involved in the – North American Limousine Foundation first, then later the American Gelvy Association, eventually becoming their executive director for uh, four years. I would have been the one who was there when they did things like smart cross and balancers and hybrid hybrid breeding and some of those sort of things. Then I moved on back home to the home operation about 2003. That's when I got more volunteer leadership. So those would be things like Minnesota State Cattlemen's Association, I went through their ranks up to president. I then uh, embarked on getting involved with the American Angus Association, became a board of director there, and eventually became their president. During that time, I also had the opportunity to be the chairman of the Certified Angus Beef. 
organization. So the CAB LLC, I was uh, chairman of, and I also was in charge of the genetic evaluation program for the American Angus Association. From there, I did a little long range planning with the North, with, uh, uh, pardon me, National Cattlemen's Beef Association, NCBA. And through that long range processing questions, they moved me on and I became an officer there and eventually became their president. Right now I sit as the past president of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, immediate past president. So that's a quick rundown, Shay, of some of the things I've done. I've done a lot of numerous other little boards, et cetera, but that's kind of the big snapshot picture of what I've done. Well, you've certainly served the industry in a multitude of ways. So where, when you think about your leadership career, in a sense, where did that start? Do you think that started all the way down when you were in junior high, high school? Did you do 4-H or FFA? Like where, or was it growing up on a family operation? Where do you think your leadership journey started? Yeah, I, I think it starts in the family, actually. You know, as I said, I have a farm with seven brothers and I am president of the, of the Sheffelbein Farms. And I think you kind of learn real well. You cut your teeth really well when you try to figure out how to move a family operation without getting people mad all the time and becoming aggressive and going forward, et cetera. So I would say probably where you learn a lot of your skill set is in that just uh, trying to lead in a family operation. The other one I would say would probably give as much experience as anybody is anybody who's been involved in breed associations know that your political skills and your leadership skills get tested when people's livelihoods are on the line, which breed associations have because most of their livelihoods are the seed stock operators and when their children are involved and they all have junior programs. And I tell you what, the quick, quickest way to hone your skills is to be in a corner and have a mom corner you with regards to why didn't Susie do what she was supposed to, or why didn't she win the award she was supposed to, and how to migrate that from a leadership standpoint? That is that is a very interesting perspective, and I know I've had a lot of families lead in um, breed association work with the Red Angus side, so I've gotten to see their experiences in those leadership roles as well. So when you think about you know, when I think about leadership, when I was in college and people were preparing me for a normal career, not necessarily production agriculture, not necessarily hands-on, in those internships and those opportunities that I took on, there's a lot of professional development towards leadership. So as someone who you weren't necessarily on the ranch all the time, but once you came back more on that hands-on role, and became president of Schieffelbein Farms. How have you continued to develop your leadership role while being more involved in production ag? Yeah, and I have a little different role belief than some as far as leadership. I there are some who go to all those seminars and say, "How do you become a better leader?" and have the gurus, if you will, of leadership tell you what a leader looks like or how they act. I really believe where our world and where our industry really is in dire need is authentic leadership. Those are people who are just genuine. They may not say things perfectly, and I've been caught of saying, picking words maybe that I probably should have chosen a little differently. But I tell you what, when it comes to being a leader and getting followers behind you, nothing is more important than truly being authentic and them believing this guy is who he says he is. He walks the walk. He talks the talk. He doesn't use crib notes to describe who he is or what he stands for. He's got deep beliefs and his leadership oozes, if you will, from within. And to me, that's where, what we're in dire need of in the beef industry and maybe as a nation as well. From an, we're going to keep this to a beef industry perspective, although I agree we need it in the nation as well. But why, why do you think we are in such dire need of that in the beef industry, these authentic leaders? Well, it's so easy, especially with the, with the rise of things like we're doing here today, podcasts and Facebook and all that electronic stuff. You can get a group of people all riled up so quickly because you all of a sudden you got a, a maskless group of 10,000 people who are chanting behind whatever somebody who may 
have never been elected actually in office for anything, but they're leading a group and saying, why are we doing this? And they may have the answers exactly wrong, okay? And so it's really hard to turn the tide on those kind of uh, issues if you don't have somebody they can look to and point to and say, yeah, but Shay didn't say that, and I believe Shay. You know what I mean? And, and that's really what we're missing is, is somebody who has enough credibility and trust and authenticness. And when it comes down to it, when they say, when they hear this whole battle cry that uh, we shouldn't be involved in sustainability in any way, shape or form. OK. And then they say, but Don Schiefelbein acts like it's OK that we need to engage with that to visit with our co consumers and respond to our consumer needs. To me, that's where we're in dire need. We need to take these uh, maskless uh, followers who just repeat what others have been t telling them and have some leaders out there who say, with my credibility and what I believe, this is the direction we need to go. So what what builds that credibility then? Because you talked about trust, credibility, and authenticity. So what yes. builds that credibility? Well, there's a term I like to use, Shay, and it's actually a, a, a term uh, I coined with uh, the American Angus Association CEO, and that is you got to earn or develop a license to lead. Okay, everybody thinks just because they got elected to a position, they have the ability to lead. No, you got to earn and gain a license to lead. And for our beef industry, that means a lifetime of have you always been honest? Have you been straightforward? Do you answer questions straight up or do you dodge them? And most importantly, and it's a quote I, uh, Shay, I absolutely love. I'm sure you've heard it many, many times. It's a quote from Henry Ford. Henry Ford's quote on leadership, and I think it's what our industry needs so, so badly, is if I would have asked Americans at the time that I had entered, in, invented the automobile what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Mm -hmm. Okay. And to me, that leadership is not about doing a survey or testing the waters and saying, what do people think? It's you developing with your knowledge base what the future ought to be and then selling that future to the rest of the world. We have too many people who respond to what the average Joe thinks at this current common denominator and say, if I want to get elected, I appease those people. That's not leadership at all. That is just uh, listening to a bunch of people who may or may not have the right answer. Leadership is about figuring out what that future ought to look like and then selling and marketing that future to whoever the public is that you're trying to merchandise it to. And we're doing a very poor job of that in the beef industry, an incredibly poor job. I was once told that I think it was the first time I kind of had a little bit of conflict come out about a podcast episode or a social media post or something like that. And one of my mentors told me, well, that's how you know you're starting to make progress is people are challenging and starting to disagree and it's not appeasing everyone. And, and then that is so right. And, you know, I believe it or not, I have some people who dislike me out there in the industry, most of them whom have never met me, right? So if you kind of Google out Don Schiefelbein, you'll find some hateful things about what I am. But there are almost always people who have never met me, got to know me or understand me. And it's because I'm challenging their ideas on what the world ought to look like in the future. And what is in missing in the beef industry from a leadership standpoint is when you're a 2% population in America, you don't lead the same way as if you're a 98% population control in the in the industry. And when you're a 2%, you better get everybody on board and be better be one of these persuasive people who say, we need to convince people to work together, get on the same bad wagon. Because if you break 2% down three ways, there is zero chance of you having success and moving forward. And to me, if you look at the weakness of our structure in the beef industry in itself, it's we've got too many organizations trying to go way too many directions, and there isn't enough common ground in what they're telling those that are elected and where we need to go. And the truth of the matter is, and this is the sad part, if you really asked those organizations how much they have in common, 
it's probably 98 to 99 percent, right? But it's that one and two percent that they just will not, will not uh, get off uh, badgering each other about and saying, let's put that aside and let's forge forward on the 98 percent. Well, and with membership organizations, in my mind, that there can be unique challenges in leading those or in being a part of them. But just because you have a membership organization that might have these core beliefs, it doesn't mean every member is going to agree on everything that's happening in the organization either. No, absolutely not. And that's all right. I know Mm -hmm. you've heard the quote said many, many times, I'm sure before, if everybody is thinking exactly alike on a board, you don't need all those people, right? Because all you needed really was one. Mm-hmm. So differences of opinions matter. It's just how do you use those differences of opinions and co- concentrate them or collectively put them into a how do we move forward given what our population or our people believe and think. And again, it goes back to what I said previously. Sometimes there's got to be leaders in the room that persuade those that may be lukewarm or have a differing opinion that for us to be truly successful, we better take that bold step that looks like it might be scary at this point. Absolutely. So you talked about, okay, so agriculture is 2%. And when you split 2% three ways, that's not a lot. You can't gain traction there. Where do you think the beef industry really needs to open our eyes? The United States beef industry. Where do we really need to open our eyes and try and find that common ground? Because from the advocacy trainings I've taken, consumers are confused because they're hearing different stories from different producers. And, you know, there's arguing within the beef industry. So where do you think we need to open our eyes? I believe all one has to have done is live through the last five years and one will quickly point to disease traceability better begin beginning to be front and center. You know, all I've done, and I've traveled across this country and visit with many groups, and I asked the question, Shay, I said, well, how do you think the government responded to a human disease outbreak? Did they do a pretty good job, or were they pretty drastic and maybe over the top? I said, now imagine... If the beef industry had a disease outbreak and we didn't have our ducks in a row and we didn't know what plan A was or plan B was or how we were going to address it, what do you think their approach would be? Do you think it'd be pretty sensible and sane or do you think they could let the direction of the scary people who are scaring people to death try to shut this industry down and put us out of business once and for all? So that's probably the area that I think We've probably failed as an industry, and I wished I could have done more well as at National Cattlemen's Beef Association. But it's one of those things that uh, so many of our producers see boogeyman when they see hear about disease traceability and managing them. I like to think of it on the proactive sense. It's almost like insurance. If we've got a lot put into our family's operation, And I believe it's important that we buy insurance through disease traceability that says somewhere along the lines, if a disease comes into this country, I have a way to make my operation continue to function because I can say the disease isn't impacting our operation. I know the ins and the outs from our traceability numbers. We're safe to sell beef to the world. Absolutely. I I had Callahan Grund on the podcast a few it was a few months ago but he kind of talked about disease traceability and the impact of that and it's mind-blowing when you hear how everything just halts it stops and or would have to and I don't think a lot of people realize that yeah and I just think you need to have a common sense I'm not into extreme what we need to do but if we don't have a plan just a plan that says if this, that they that our producers understand there's a plan but i don't think any of our producers understand that in the plan that we currently have the world stops for 72 hours right mm-hmm. and whether or not we can function in that world i don't know if we can and whether or not we know exactly what it takes after that first 72 hour stoppage how we get our traction going again mm-hmm. and to me some of those basic things better be figured out pretty well if yours and my livelihoods need to keep going. Because what I know with certainty, and this is the one probably huge advantage I have that many don't have, 
being the kind of the front and center guy for National Cattlemen's Beef Association is I know the enemies of the beef industry incredibly well. And I mean, they want to do everything they can to put us out of business. And given the opportunity with a disease outbreak, they will pounce and they will pounce hard and fast. And if we don't have our act together, we'll all of a sudden wake up the next day and say, how did we lose our beef industry? What just happened? And to me, it means getting along and figuring out a plan and quit worrying about these issues that we don't agree on and start worrying about some uh, issues that we do agree on. <clears throat> do you think we get too rooted in tradition sometimes that we forget that we do have enemies out there who would take the opportunity to put us out of business? And it's worse than that, probably, Shay. You know, if you look at some of the very beef organizations that are defending beef producers and they're trying to defend them really hard, some of them are cooperating with our worst enemies. HSUS, Humane Society of the United States, is an industry entity that wants to put us out of business, plain and simple. They want to put animal agriculture out of business. One organization in the, in the beef industry world is working with them through some lawsuits that are suing ourselves, right? So it's they're trying to stop checkoff. They're suing ourselves. They're, yeah. A beef organization is using dollars from HSUS to sue ourselves. If we are suing ourselves, Shay, what chance do we have when the enemies really want to put the press on us? The, the reality is, and, I, and I've said this joking, jokingly, but there's some reality to it. Our enemies need to sponsor more of our industry meetings because when we get together, we tend to fight instead of get along, right? And they need to just keep funding our getting togethers because that's when we fight and do our most harm. And that's a sad, sad state of affairs for a beef industry that's only 2% of the world are within ag. Hey folks, I want to introduce you to a breakthrough in cattle deworming from Zoetis. This is the only prescription cattle dewormer with two active ingredients in one dose. Meet Valcor, Doramectin, and Levamisole injection. Now you can achieve effective parasite control in one product instead of two. It's never been easier to be tough on tough worms. Get tough today at Valcor.com. Do not treat cattle with Valcor within 15 days of slaughter. Not for use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older, including dry dairy cows. Not for use in beef calves less than 2 months of age, dairy calves, and veal calves. See full pricing information at valcortuff.com slash PI. And that link will be in the show notes. That is very sad. What? So you talked about disease traceability as being important for beef producers to get on, find common ground. Yep. What else? I think animal care is a huge one because that's one, this world's shifting and, and, and we live in the rural life, okay? And I don't know if you've ever seen an election map by county, uh, by the president. If you look at a presidential election results by county, you will see the vast, vast majority of the United States in terms of area probably think like you and I, okay? They probably think like you and I. But, and it colors that map almost entirely red. The reality is, though, blue won, okay? So it's concentrated areas of populations. And, Shay, the biggest concern I have with regard to this change of footing that we have is today, over 50% of our population now is three generations removed from agriculture. 50% of the populations three generations removed so they they don't know how you think Shay. they don't know how i think they have no idea so if we don't get our act together on animal welfare that 50 percent that are three generations removed from agriculture they all have a dog or a cat and that dog or cat is their family member as well right they extend that whole animal welfare animal rights mentality if you will to cattle and pigs and sheep, et cetera. And they, our enemies are tugging on their heartstrings, if you will. And they're saying, Shay, we know you love your cat, right? And you know you love your dog, right? 
Don't you like beef animals too? Don't you want to care for them? And look at these rotten, horrible beef producers out there and they're misconstruing everything we're doing. But when they're so removed from our operations, they don't win. We, they don't know if they're right or they're wrong, right? So it's the big, biggest megaphone that wins, right? So if they have a bigger war chest than you and I do, and they can begin to tell somebody that black is white, and they don't know the difference between black and white, guess what? They begin to start believing. Black becomes white. Mm hmm and that's that is the real risk we have in our industry and that is why we better speak with one voice we better get our act together because those that are opposed to us know how to mislead a consuming public on an issue and if your listening population doesn't believe that all one has to do is look at climate change in cows talk about the craziest target to be placed on the cattle industry with climate change, etc. It makes no sense if you look at the numbers. It makes no sense if anybody's walked through a green pasture and said, are these cows good for the environment? You would have to take 10 steps to figure out they're not good for the environment. They're great for the environment. Yet those that oppose us have flipped that script on us and uh, when I was on the long range plan 10 years ago, Gaucher, we did a little Google exercise. I made them do a little Google exercise because they weren't believing that in us promoting how good cattle are for the environment was where we need to go. They said, that's ridiculous. Everybody knows cows are good for the environment. And we did in that meeting, Shay, something that everybody should do more often is we went to the real masters of decisions and decided what the answer was. What we did was we Googled it. I made everybody get out their cell phone, Google, are cattle good for the environment? This was 10 years ago, mm -hmm. okay? Guess what the top 10 answers told us? No. No. And so we had to engage in that area. That's why a National Cattlemen's Beef Association had to engage in that area because we were losing something that was obviously we were incredibly good at. Now, we've balanced that a little more today, but we're still, Shay, when they have the megaphone and the dollars and 50% are three generations removed from ag, we better get our act together. One website that I like to go look at, it's called Answer the Public, and you can get two or three free searches a day before you pay for it. But okay. anytime I do like an advocacy training or if I'm just curious about stuff, I'll type in just the word beef and it'll show up like the is beef, how beef, what, why, where, it'll show up all these common searches from across different platforms. And it's, it's concerning. I mean, there are a few that bring you hope, but not compared to the ones that, you know, people are wondering, is beef meat? I mean, just some and, of- And we got to, har Shay, you're so right. So we have to harness our resources to correct the record, if you will. And- over the last three years, NCBA had to spend two million of our hard-earned dollars to defend our own checkoff among our own beef producers. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that's just the travesty. So here are these big enemies who are wanting to put us out of business, and we're having to spend huge sums of money not defending them and not defending how cattle are good for the environment, not saying, boy, we better work on this disease traceability, but instead we have to say, we have to fight it among ourselves saying, hey, we can take a check off and use those monies to help promote a beef industry in a positive way. So with the arguing that goes amongst beef producers in our industry, how do you think we take down our own walls and try to work with one another? Because I catch myself getting defensive about my beliefs compared to other people's beliefs too. And it's something I work on and I try to bring down those walls and try and focus on what's important. But what, even whether we're in leadership roles or not, what do we need to do as individual producers to move the industry forward? I, I think it starts off with, at least for me, it does. I believe, I don't know if you've ever heard this song, most people are good. I believe in our industry 
the vast, vast, vast major majority of beef producers are really, really good people. So if they're missing an issue or they're attacking us on an issue, we probably have to look at ourselves and say, we failed somewhere explaining that issue to the public, right? To our producers. Mm -hmm. Otherwise they'd be on our side. And I think there's a couple of issues that uh, we have really failed as a beef industry and in getting people to understand the why it's important that we're in this side of the issue. And some of them, I think uh, the industry's made some mistakes early on and won't own up to them. And then all of a sudden they developed, if you will, this enemy profile that are coming to get us because maybe we missed and maybe we were incorrect on where we ought to go 20 or 30 years ago. Is there anything else you want to add to the conversation about making sure that we as beef producers don't argue so much that we take out ourselves? Yeah, and again, yeah, I, I think it really comes back to that whole trust. And that's why I think leadership, you better not just, and this is where I'm, I call myself the Forrest Gump. You know, I was never a huge NCBA waiver. I, I wasn't the NCBA flag waiver wherever I went. I was just a guy who believed in agriculture, believed in the beef industry. And I tell you what, NCBA took a chance on me because I am not one who follows orders very well. I don't follow company lines. I believe what I believe. And I think we need more of those kind of people engaging in organizations and becoming part of that organization to make it better. This whole idea, and this is where I think our industry has gone awry, this whole idea within our industry that is if you're mad at NCBA or you're mad at an organization, you know what we do? We start a new organization. That is absolutely a failed thought process. Think about, and I want everybody to think the example of America, okay? I believe that America probably is not going in the best direction right now, okay? Does that mean I quit America? Does that mean I say, you know what? To heck with America. I'm just going to start my own world called Don Schiefelbein Inc. and to heck with the rest of the world. No, the way you get America better, the way you get NCBA better, is that you rejoin that organization, you get more aggressive in that organization, you bring your neighbors to your north, to your south, to your east and your west and say, you know what, I know they're missing this issue, let's beat it in their head because guess what, majority still rules and let's tell them why we need to go left instead of right. Let's not quit the organization and start two or three more. Let's retake the organization. Let's put it on a path that makes sense. And let's march forward in a direction together. I think sometimes we try to avoid conflict and assume it's always bad. But the reality is you can't get to the solution without some sort of conflict or yeah, disagreement. And and yeah, and conflict and doesn't have to be bad. No, no. And a perfect example of that was during my leadership, we had a lot of discussion on whether or not the government should be involved in pricing cattle, right? We had a marketing meeting that lasted seven hours, Shay. And it was, I mean, it was brutal. It was people saying things and bad words. And I mean, it was brutal, right? And everybody was, after we huddled up after it was over as an officer team and everybody was like, Boy, that was a disaster. That was horrible. And I said, no, that's what democracy is about. That's exactly. You want to show the world that if you disagree, this is how you resolve it. You get in there, you arm wrestle, you talk, you debate, you discuss, you figure out what a path forward looks like. And then you eventually come together and go with that path forward. So that's what it's supposed to look like. It's not supposed to be always pretty. Democracy in itself sometimes gets pretty dang ugly. Because you want to make sure everybody's opinion is heard. But then at the end, you have to forge a battle plan, if you will, that says, how do we go forward where everybody can agree to go forward? So when you've been a part of leading membership organizations, what were some of the biggest challenges of those leadership roles? You know, it depends. So, so much of... Uh, so much of the challenges really is how do you get to those with the truth? And that really is what it comes down to. 
the truth eventually will prevail if you get the truth to them, okay? But so many, and you, you, you know this in Red Angus or any organization you're involved with, there's only about 5% that show up, right? Mm -hmm. So there's 95%, give or take, out there that you don't have a direct influence on getting to. And so what you really have to do is figure out how do you get the truth how do you get the reality to the 95%? And it's doing things like what we're doing here today, Shay, is we're going and saying, you know what? Shay's got an audience and a group that probably never go have ever been to an NCBA convention, maybe. Maybe they've never get, been to the American Angus Association convention. But they are as important in deciding which direction we go as any group. So we have to figure out how do we get out to those leaders or influencers that we can share the truth in a manner that people understand why we're doing what we're doing. Well, and you can't make every convention. Not every person from your operation can leave all at once. My parents are at National Red Angus Convention right now, so I stayed home. There are times I leave and they stay home. You got to balance it out. And, and again, that's where if I were to say the biggest concern I have it's the 95%, and we talked about this a little earlier, the 95% can be led by a Facebook post, right? Because they can all go to Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it, it doesn't have to be truthful, believe it or not, right? They can put in the Facebook whatever they want, and they can say it in an emotional, heart-tugging way that if you read it and didn't know what the true, real truth was, you and I might be susceptible to say, Boy, why would they do that? Or why are they doing that? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so somehow we have to figure out how to crack that egg. How do we crack the egg where we can get to the 95% without having the sensationalism that typically occurs in those Facebook posts? Because the reality is, Shay, and you know this, sometimes the truth is not as sexy is the craziness that they write. Oh, I know right. it's not. I mean, I try, you know, when I'm writing descriptions of my podcasts, um, creating podcast titles, like I have to make them truthful, but sometimes the most truthful words aren't the most enticing to pull people in. So you got to balance it. But on that same front, like you said, you can also, they can be manipulative, especially if you look at some of the, AI tools that are out there now, yep. you can do yep. a lot of, they can be very helpful. They can be very bad. It's and, all on how and, they're used. And, and going back to leadership, this probably may be where I have an advantage is there's a, a concept I've always said within leaders and it, it sometimes people don't take it very well is there are a lot of leaders that are too smart for their own good. Okay. And, and they usually are the ones who show up, right? These really smart people show up and they're really geniuses and they show up and they have these great ideas, but it's not relatable to average Joe, right? Mm -hmm. And they forget that we're still in an average Joe world, right? And so they have these crazy smart ideas, but they're really too smart for their own good. And if you look at uh, breed association leadership, Gosh, you can see that time and time again where they get too far out in front of their audience and they fail miserably because they were just not wrong. They were just too smart for their own good. OK, many of the leaders in our world are that way, especially in the beef world. If you look at who's on the boards and who shows up at whether it's NCBA, American Angus, Red Angus, Brahmin. They're really, really smart people and maybe too smart to be successful. If you look at the people who are writing the Facebook posts that'll have 20 or 30,000 followers, I guarantee you their IQs would not compete with a lot of people who are in those leadership rooms, but they got 20 or 30,000 people following them. But you they know how me? to connect. They know yes, exactly. Exa exactly. That's and that's what we're missing is that communication link in a common sense manner that doesn't get too far out in front of their audiences. You know, if we think about the old game we all played as kids, telephone, 
how many people did it go through before it got passed down to that person if we're looking at the other 95%? Because yes, there's press releases, there's podcasts, there's great trustworthy information sources out there. But when we look at agriculture, we still love word of mouth. You know, word of hearing something word of mouth is still different for me than if I hear it from a podcast or newsletter. I we we like it. We like to hear it from people we know. We like to hear it from people we trust. But is it getting construed in that process? You've got it. I think that's uh, well said. So, Don, we've talked a lot about the challenges of the beef industry. We've talked about leadership on a more positive note, because you wouldn't be in the beef industry and leading it if you didn't enjoy it and weren't proud of it in some way. What are you proud of the United States beef industry for? Oh, our demand is incredible, Shay. What we've been able to do with demand for beef is nothing short of startling. And again, I'm a little bit of a different age group than you are, right? So I lived through the 80s and early 90s when our demand, Shay, was pathetic. It was terrible. We were not responsive to the consumers. It was the old, what I like to say, the old John Wayne mentality of the beef industry. It's my way or the highway. And if you don't, if you disagree with us, we'll find a tree and a rope and we'll fix that, right? Our whole industry has changed so dramatically, led by such organizations as Certified Angus Beef that have gotten closer to the consumer, right? And that have allowed us to say, well, really the consumers want this. Given what we went through with COVID, okay, and the dollars people had to pay to eat beef and were willing to pay, Mm -hmm. what we've discovered is People love our product, right? And their willingness to pay for our product is way higher than we ever dreamed it was. And that's why when you look into the next stage of the cycle that we're heading to, and we're looking at these calf prices that I'm sure your dad and you have been studying and saying, I can't believe they're this high, right? (laughs) It's because demand for beef is incredible. Specifically, demand for U.S. beef Mm -hmm. is incredible. And to me, that is that is the most positive story that's not mentioned enough. And if you were, for all the things you want to pick on our industry over, saying we're fighting over this or we're arguing over this, gosh, producers responded when given the challenge of changing their product to more consumer-friendly, high-demand product. Beef's in a very good spot. And I look at my competitors in terms of pork and chicken, not in the same spot, Shay. We are so much better positioned than both those two proteins that to me, the future looks incredibly bright. Yes, absolutely. Well, Don, before we wrap up today, do you have any final thoughts you want to share with those listening? No, I just, I would just ask them that uh, before you become the naysayer, before you're concerned, be a joiner first, join the organization, figure it out, attend their, what they're up to and see if it makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense, don't start a new organization, change the ones that exist, make them better. Use your influence and your knowledge to make the world a better place. You know, anybody can stay at home and gripe and whine, right? It's hard to engage and try and make things in a more positive way. I would encourage those people out there, the 95%, boy, tell us what what we ought to do. We want to hear from you. We appreciate you. Believe it or not, and this is the thing that most people don't realize, both on elected leaders that have had the opportunity to serve with, as well as the elected leaders that write the laws for our country. Everybody in the vast, vast number want to do right by beef producers. They want, they want to do the right answer. Maybe they aren't doing the right answer because they don't know. But the bottom line is they want a road to what beef producers say they need to have to be successful. Because I can assure you the way you get reelected as a leader, the way you get reelected as a uh, congressman is when the world is full and happy. And so they want beef producers to be successful. All right. Well, thank you very much, Don, for taking time out of your day to visit with me. Thank you, Shay, and thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. 
Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.